cardiac uh, in the EMS field, we follow the American Heart Association gu guidelines. So what I recommend for you guys to do is if you don't already have a little uh, American Heart Association BLS book, I would go ahead and buy one. And that's the, the CPR book that people use for American Heart Association. And just review it, go through it. Um, it's, it'll definitely help you out for your NRENT because pretty much anything cardiac comes from the American Heart Association. And the BLS book is super thin. You can, you can run through it in a couple of days if you want to just, just really actually go through it and learn some stuff. But this is the chain of survival, which of course comes from the American Heart Association. Uh, so immediate recognition is key. Um, I've been to a call where the patient had literally just went into cardiac arrest in front of us and we saved them. I've also been on calls where the patient was in cardiac arrest for about 20, 15 minutes and we didn't save them. Uh, so it's the faster you get to the patient and the faster you re recognize that they might be going through cardiac arrest, the higher the, ch the survival um, rates are gonna be for patients. Uh, most likely a bystander will be the one that's gonna recognize uh, cardiac arrest and call 911 and start that early CPR, hopefully. Uh, so as far as three ways CPR can be delivered, uh, obviously you guys would be the main option that people want, uh, EMTs come in there, trained professionals to do CPR on a patient. Uh, lay people would be pretty much, lay people is anybody that's out on the streets, anybody that, that's walking around with a CPR card, that, that is considered a lay person. Um, they're just typical civilians that are training CPR for one reason or another. The other one, of course, dispatchers nowadays, they are trained on how to give people instructions that call them given a certain situation, and CPR is one of them. They can actually walk you through CPR and you just put them on speaker. See, as far as changes implemented in CPR, things change every five years for the American Heart Association. So every five years, you're going to be hearing of new information coming out regarding CPR. Um, what they do is they they come out with the new uh, new implementations, um, you know, every five years, and then they take five years to collect data to see if those new implementations were actually correct or not, and if changes are needed or not. So every five years, you know, we see that certain things are helping, certain things aren't helping. Um, maybe we should add some other things to CPR, and that's why every five years you'll have different uh, changes. So spending half of each compression on the downstroke and half on the upstroke. So up and down, just make sure you have a good, a good even rhythm. And of course, you want to go down at least two inches for your adults. <clears throat> See, uh, using correct hand position. And we went over all these numbers and, and things the very first two days in class. But these are some numbers you want to remember for CPR. Again, for the American Heart Association, compression should be between 100 and 120 compressions per minute. Okay. Um, and when you give the ventilation, remember it's 30 compressions, two breaths. Every breath should be no longer than two than one second each, okay? And no more than 10 seconds of a break or interruptions between actual chest compressions because we want to keep that pressure up. Every time you let, let go of the chest to go do anything else, that pressure plummets back down. And what we want is to keep that pressure in the vessels high to feed the tissues of the body. talked about this already so your AED as soon as your AED gets there your AED is priority for especially for your adult patients because adult patients there's a high chance that if they collapse it's from cardiac and the only way to reverse that is if we reset that heart with an AED or some kind of shock all right CPR by itself is not going to bring them back to life it's going to improve their chances of coming back to life and still having good tissue in place as far as the brain goes but it's not gonna bring them back to life. What's gonna bring them back to life is shocking that heart and, and resetting that heart so it can start pumping again, okay? So once that AED gets there, that becomes your priority. Again, first thing you do when you get it, you turn it on 
and just follow instructions at least. And it's gonna walk you through every single thing. Obviously, if you have paramedics there, um, it would be nice to use them, but they're not always gonna be present. Um, so you just keep that in mind. But the, the ultimate goal for cardiac patients is to get advanced life support, whether that's getting your paramedic on scene or getting into the hospital as soon as possible. But the ultimate goal is advanced life support. As, B, as EMTs and basic life support, our job is just to kind of maintain and preserve the body where it's at so that ALS and definitive care, definitive care being the hospital. So definitive care means like what ultimately has to be done for this patient to make sure they're okay. That's definitive care. And that's ultimately what needs to be done for the patient. And of course that is part of advanced life support is definitive care. Uh, EMT provides two links. So early CPR and rapid defibrillation. Like I said, once that AED gets there, that AED needs to go on that patient and you need to shock that patient as soon as possible. That's your, your good hand placement right there. Uh, across the nipple line, you would draw an imaginary nipple line, uh, midline, and you would place, place the heel of your hand, the bottom half of your hand on the center of the chest um, and squeeze downward like that. And again, your shoulders up here should be squared up directly over your hands. That way all your pressure falls on the heel of the hand. See, this is just uh. So as far as AEDs, uh, this is, is a note in case you don't have it. Two types of AEDs. There's monophonic and um, I'm sorry, monophasic and biphasic. So all monophasic means that. Let's see. Let's pretend that this right here is so this D is a is a pad, right? And this D is a pad, and the letters in between that's your patient. So the AED pad, when it's monophasic, that means that electricity goes from one pad to the other pad, and that's it. And biphasic, that means that electricity goes from one pad to the other pad, and that electricity bounces back to the original pad. Hopefully that makes sense. So that's all that means. That monophasic means only one shock is sent. Biphasic means two shocks are sent back and forth. What's the purpose for the biphasic? Uh, the per I know, well, biphasic is much better than monophasic from, um, monophasic is more like the old school machines and biphasic is what they're all being now. Because um, if you have two, two currents passing back to back, the chances of helping the patient become greater. So pretty much uh, everything was monophasic and we're shifting over to biphasic. And that's the only difference. I mean, that's the purpose is that it's better than monophasic. So uh, how do they work? So all they all they do is that the pads are programmed to analyze the heart rhythm, and it's only programmed to pick up two dysrhythmias, only two. And I talked about them. One of them is pulseless tachycardia. So what pulseless tachycardia means that the conduction system the, is go, is uh, sending out signals, electrical signals, at over a hundred beats per minute. So the machine, the EKG, the EKG machine may be picking up the signals of normal cardi cardiac conduction at a high at a high rate above 100 because it's tachycardia, but but it's not. But the heart is not actually mechanically pumping. There's a there's a cutoff between the electricity part and the mechanical part of, a, of the heart, and that's why it's pulseless tachycardia, pulseless ventricular tachycardia, because there is there's only electrical activity, but a, a pulse is not created because the mechanical part is not there, okay? So it picks up that one, pulses, VTAC, and ventricular fibrillation. It's only gonna pick those two up. And if either one of those are present, your patient will get a shock. Oh, and then this is what I just talked 